You are merciful to me. You are merciful to me. You are merciful to me, my Lord.
one last little tag I'd like to do this every Sunday morning. And oh, how he loves you and me.
futures. Patrick said we're going to have some tough times and rebels on the work. I hate it. He is. And I know something in there he already has started. We know because of him, because of Christ, we can face it on the day. Because of Christ, we can go on. God sent his son.
under his armor, protect your house. We already read the scripture verses that begin the message this morning as we opened the service this morning. Again, you saw them reiterated in the video again. But again, something I want to reiterate to you again today, as we've done every other week, is that Satan has lost this war. He's lost, and he knows he's lost. Now, with that being said, there are battles that we as individuals have to fight, and, and those battles he can win against us if we allow him to. Now again, he's lost the war. As far as it comes to him taking on God and taking on the Lamb of God, taking on Jesus Christ, that war has been won. The outcome of that war has already been determined when Jesus Christ died on Calvary, gave his life, and uttered three words, it is finished. That finished the devil. And then what even put the final nail into the coffin was that three days later he uttered three last words, and three days later he rose from the grave, which we're going to be um, celebrating in just two weeks from today. We're going to be celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. That three days after he uttered those words, he rose from the grave. His body, that dead body, the power of the Bible says that the power of God entered into that body again, and he rose up with power and glory to live forevermore. Now you need to understand, this is also a concept that Jesus, as a human, you know, he was God eternal. So death was something that cannot happen to God. That's, but he took on the human flesh. He was 100% man, 100% God, and yet he died in this human flesh to condemn sin in the flesh, to finally beat it. But he rose victorious. And because of that, we have the victory. So the devil knows he's lost the overall war, but the battles that are still raging are the battles that are fought for what? Our soul. For our place in heaven, for us making heaven, heaven our home. And that's what we've been dealing with, talking about under his armor, is taking on this armor as we read at the beginning of the service, is so we can what? Be able to be victorious against the enemy. This is what will make us victorious, the armor of God. And as we started this series, we're in actually week seven now of this, we went through and we, the first week we started about what is spiritual warfare. I'm going to go through these very, very briefly. But spiritual warfare is a never-ending battle, the never-ending battle between our flesh and our spirit, the trials and tribulations we face in our everyday life, the people and things that come against us when we are living, trying to live godly lives. So that's what spiritual warfare is. And week two, we looked at the unseen war. And who is our enemy? The enemy is Satan and his forces. The attacks may come a lot of different ways, but they all come from one place. They come from him. And again, I said this before, Satan knows he's dealing with human beings a whole lot better than we realize we're dealing with spirits. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, as we read in our portion of Scripture. Then weeks, and three, weeks three and four, we dealt with the schemes and the strategy of the devil. We said he had a strategy, and he also one of his strategies called the eye plan. But how does he bring his strategy about? First off, his strategy is to destroy you at all costs. Remember that. We've been dealing with this a lot on Wednesday nights. You've heard me say it about here these last several Sundays, dealing with this subject. Satan's desire is to destroy you, is to destroy you at all costs. He will not, he will, he will pull out all the stops to destroy you. And he does this by getting you to focus mainly, the battle's in your mind, but to mainly get you to focus on who? Me, myself, <coughs> and I. See, the problem is when we allow I to get in the way, it doesn't allow God to be the God that he needs to be. That's what, that's what I was telling you about this morning. It's all about him, folks. It's about Jesus Christ. And if we remember that, if it's about Him, it's about Him, it's about Him, and not about us, you will win this war. You will win the battle that you're in if you realize it's not about you. It's not about I, but it's about who? It's about Him. It's not about whether or not you come to church and the preacher's preaching the thing that you like to hear. That doesn't matter. What matters is the kingdom of God. It's about Him. That's what it's about. Whenever we get ourselves in the picture about what I like and whatever, we will find ourselves in trouble. So these are some of the things that the enemy does. And then over the past two weeks prior to this, we've been dealing with some different parts of the armor. But real quick, I want to introduce to you our piece of armor we're going to be talking about today. Peace. Yeah, especially since I'm right behind you, right? 
So we need to understand that these weapons that God has given us, they are capable of demolishing strongholds. They're capable of allowing you to stand against anything that the devil will bring your way. But again, the devil is not dumb. Remember, we, it talks about these portions of Scripture too. We, we haven't got the part where we're reading yet, but it talks about why we take the shield of faith as what? To quench the fiery darts of the wicked. You notice it doesn't say dart. It says darts. Because he will... Anybody ever see the movie 300? And... Um, and, and one of them said, you know, we're going to bear it, you know, we're going to um, block out the sun with our arrows. And then he said, well, we will fight in the shade then. The enemy's attack is sort of like that. He will send a barrage against you because he's aiming for it to hit any spot that may not be covered by the armor. See, that's why it's so important to take on all the armor of God. Because if he can hit a spot that's unprotected, then he can start to get a stronghold, a foothold, a toehold. In your life. How many of you know it's dangerous to let the enemy just even just begin his foot in the door? If you can get that crack, you can, what do you start to do? That door cracked, and you start to get what? Open wider and wider and wider until you come in completely. But we, we talked about the first piece of armor that we discussed was the belt of truth. Everything around us, the belt is what holds the stuff together, which means to tell us what? Truth is what holds it together. The truth is the truth is the truth. It's always the truth. It's not truth just because of certain circumstances, situations. That's the case. It's truly not truth. The truth is always the truth. Period. Then we dealt with the, the, um, the breastplate or the body armor of righteousness. We need to understand. I've, I've been talking to several people about this over the past several weeks. and we, Again, we've been dealing with this on Wednesday nights. We talked about it up here. Our righteousness isn't in anything that we do. It is simply because of the life that Jesus Christ lived. Our righteousness is Him. The breastplate, the body armor that we put on is Jesus. That's what it is. So that's one of the things we dealt with. And today, we're dealing with the third one. The shoes of the gospel of peace. There were several things. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Roman shoes uh, and what they were. The shoes of the Roman soldier were made with special care. They were designed to protect, to protect the soldier as well as enable him to travel long distances. The soles were designed with layers of metal and leather and had hob nails, spikes about a half inch to an inch long sticking out of the sole of the soldier so he could plant his feet into the ground so he would not be moved. But also, it could be used as a defensive weapon. Imagine if your, your shoe had, you know, I've mean, never seen golf shoes and sometimes they have the metal spikes on. Well, sort of imagine something like that, but I'm sure these spikes may, have, I don't know if they were sharp or whatever, but someone come up and actually stomp it on you with one of them. That's not going to feel too good, is it? So when you think about it, yes, the, the Roman soldier's shoes was what well, was a shoe that allowed them to get um, traction and training. Where they did their one move, they, had, they held their shield up and they dug their feet in. Good luck pushing them back because they were, they were dug in. See, these shoes that we're talking about, when you read in the Bible, shod, shod literally means shoe. Okay, that's, so if you, you understand, well, what does it mean shod? Shod literally means shoe, to put on shoes, okay, to be shoed with. Like you would shoe a horse, you would shod a horse. And you put the shoes on them, you put our shoes on them. But these shoes could be used for defense. They could be used for offense. They, they were designed to where it would allow them to walk down the road that even though the road may be treacherous, they could still get where they were going. So the, the shoes were very, very important. In fact, I was watching um, something on History Channel the other day, and, and, and they were talking about how they found the, 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 the ice man that they found in, uh, oh, where was it? It doesn't, doesn't matter. They, they found him. They found his remains, and he actually had on... Um, a pair of shoes. I was watching something about the history of everyday things. So they're talking about like shoes, toothbrushes, um, running water, toilet, all kinds of stuff. And, um, but they were talking about how those shoes were designed and they actually made a replica of them and gave to a modern mountain, mountaineer. Because they found this guy like in the Himalayas or something like that. And, and, the, and the mountain climber said, you know, these type of shoes here were actually almost far superior to anything we have today. Because it will allow them to get the traction they need to get, to keep their feet warm, and all this stuff. So, when we talk about shoes here, you know, we weren't talking about dummies who, who didn't know how to make things. These things were designed for the purpose of allowing a soldier to keep his traction, to be offensive, and all this stuff. So, when, when Paul's talking about this, we need to understand the importance of these shoes, and, and we need to put them on. But with these shoes, I'm going to be looking at what it talks about in the New King James Version, how it brings it out. In verse 15 of Ephesians 6, in the New King James Version, it says, And having shouted, shoot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 
So the main thing I'm going to be talking about this morning is we're going to talk about the preparation factor, but I'll get there in just one second. So today, we have to ask ourselves these following questions. Number one, have you put on the belt of truth? In other words, have you accepted Jesus Christ? Do you realize and know that He is the truth? The, Jesus Himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come unto the Father except how? Through Him. There's no other way to God. There's no other way to heaven besides Jesus Christ. He alone. The Bible tells us what? Jesus said, it says, your word is true. But yet we also know that Jesus is known as the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. So, have you put on the belt of truth? Have you accepted Jesus Christ? Have you put on the breastplate or the body armor of righteousness? In other words, have you accepted that Jesus died for your sins and that you are forgiven and have been given God's righteousness to protect your heart and weak areas of your life from satanic attack? Again, it's nothing you can do. You must stand in His righteousness. With Him, all things are possible. We just need to step out in Him and Sometimes people say, well, I can't do it. With Jesus, you can. You just need to understand it truly. Greater, how many times do you say this? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And then the last question is, have we put on the shoes of preparation? Have I made myself ready to share Christ with others? These, the preparation of the gospel of peace. I have to look this up. The word peace there is, is a word that literally means a state of being. It doesn't mean just... Um, you know, like peace to the world, but it's literally having contentment of, of soul and spirit. That yes, it is a gospel of peace we're trying to, 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 share with, to share with people, but Jesus said this, there will be no peace until He comes. Until He comes back as the King of Kings, Lord, do you understand the world will not experience peace as the world is looking for it. But as children of God, when we're talking about the gospel of peace, or us getting the peace that He has, that's a little different. That means we can have contentment no matter what. We can have calm. We can have solace no matter what is going on in our lives. We can sit there and realize that truly God is with us. And realize we're not in this thing alone. So I don't care what hell and what is going on in your life with Jesus Christ. Have a relationship with Him. You can have a calm about going through this. Not saying you want to go through it. That's not what I'm telling you. But what I'm saying that when these things are forced upon you, when they happen, He will give you the strength, the solitude, the calmness to make it through. When the doctor comes in and all of a sudden gives you a diagnosis where you have a terminal case of cancer, how many of y'all know that is something that happens to children of God? It does happen. You know, yes, we, we, we know God heals, but sometimes that doesn't get healed. Because sometimes God's going to use it to where you can use that sickness for His honor, for His glory. You know, these things, we see, we need to understand it. You know, if God all, all the time always pulled us out of the fire, we would never learn. If all of a sudden, something would, every time something was wrong, He would deliver us from us, how would we ever learn? We would basically turn into brats. All would be that is, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, God. And never, Lord, thank you so much for being with me and seeing me through I said, what I'm talking, I know it's not easy. But that is what peace is. But we're not going to really be focusing so much on the peace this morning. I'm going to focus more this morning on the preparedness. So how do you, how do the shoes of preparedness protect you? How, how can being prepared protect you with this body of armor? There's many different things we could talk about with these shoes this morning. We could pull out the gospel, which I'll touch that very briefly. I, I very briefly touched the piece this morning, but we're going to be talking about preparedness. Why is this considered the armor of God? Preparedness. Preparedness. Talk about shoes with preparedness. To prepare ourselves, we must study God's Word. How many of you know that's not a bad thing? To prepare ourselves, we must study God's Word. By studying, we become more knowledgeable about the will and character of God, as well as give ourselves ammunition against the devil. So it's important because, first off, the more we know about Him, the better off we are. The more we know Him, the more and likely we'll become like Him. And it is not a bad thing to begin to take on the nature and the character of God. We will never become God because we are not God. But to take on his character of love and, and justice. See, you know, a lot of times, a lot of people don't want to throw their love and, and justice together. But, but God, he is. He's a, he's, 
all love, but yet he's a God of justice. He's a God of mercy, but yet he is a God of wrath. So you put all these work in perfect harmony in him. But we need to take these things on so we can learn more about him. We need to prepare ourselves because in Hosea ch chapter 4, verse 6, it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also I, I also will reject you for being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also I also will forget your children. So again, with if we do not study, if we do not dive into the Word of God, if we do not pick up the Bible and read it and begin to find out what this whole thing's about, in other words, the Bible says that we're just servicing ourselves and literally. God can't come to our aid the way He wants. Because what? If we refuse His knowledge, He'll refuse us. He'll reject us. If we, if we reject His Word, it's got to be more than just me telling you about it. Because I can change, you know, again, I'm going to do it one of these Sundays, and I think I've done it in the past four, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to change the Scripture verse up. I'm going to make it say completely something different it's supposed to say. And see if anybody even picks up on it. So hopefully you check me today and make sure what I'm telling you is the truth. I didn't change any of this up, by the way. Just let you know. But if we don't pursue Him, we're going to be in trouble. But what's the like? The lack of His Word. In 2 Timothy 2.15, we are told to work hard to study in the New Living Translation. To study so that you can present yourselves to God and receive His approval. Be a good worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the Word of Truth. So in other words, the Bible is simply telling you, have you, ever, have you ever had anybody ask you a question and you say, well, I just don't know the answer, especially if it's about the Bible? Say, I just don't know. Well, if you don't know, let me, let me ask you a question. Let me just study you. Well, if you don't, then I'm surprised you don't know. But if you haven't studied and you don't know, then tell you, well, guess what? You maybe just need to say, God, will you... Reveal that to me. Would you maybe send somebody my way, somebody I can go talk to you, who may have a little bit deeper understanding than I do? But the Bible says that if we study His thing, study His Word, we can learn enough to where we will know how to rightly explain and rightly divide the Word of Truth to explain it. See, knowing and understanding the Word of God will not allow Satan to push you around because you will be rooted and grounded in the truth of the gospel. Those shoes of God will dig in and grip no matter how great the pressure may be. No matter how great it may be, He will allow you to dig in. You can say, and you, because I'll tell you, we've been, the devil says a lot of things. Everything he says, you need to understand, everything he says has a hint of truth in it. That's why a lot of times we believe it. It has a hint of truth in it. But there's a problem. It just has a hint of truth. Remember, the truth is 100% the truth. If there's just a hint of truth in it, then what's the rest of it? So what's that make? That. It makes it a lie. It makes it false. So the devil speaks of who he is. He, everything he says will have the hint of truth in it. But it is an out and out lie because he is, the Bible says, in him there is no truth. He is the father of lies. When he speaks lies, he speaks of himself. So by getting in the Word of God, we will be able to discern that He's truly telling us a lie. And when He's talking to you, you understand it. He is lying. But how can we share Jesus in the Gospel if we don't understand or know His Word? We're talking about the, you know, the preparation of the Gospel peace. Going out and taking on this armor is literally going out and sharing the Gospel. How can we do this if we don't prepare ourselves, if we don't know His Word? Now again, we'll be saying that. I'm not telling you if you're not well versed in Scripture that you do not share your testimony or you don't tell people about Jesus Christ. That's not what I'm telling you. The more you know Him, the more effective your testimony can be because then you can answer questions. It says, hey, let me go get the answer for you. But no matter what, we need to share our testimony. We need to share the Gospel, what Jesus has done with us with everybody we come in contact with. No matter if you've been a Christian for a day or a hundred years. And someone's been in here living 100 years, praise God, bless you this morning. <laughs> but we're, we're to share the gospel message that people come in contact with. We need to be prepared. In fact, there's a story that a minister named Brian Schill shares. It's called the Jehovah's Witness story. And here's how it goes. 
It says, I was ready for a relaxing evening of working on my RV. My mind was not on the Word of God, but on where I left my Phillips screwdriver because I was replacing a mirror inside the bathroom of the RV. A young man named James showed up and asked me if he could speak with me. It didn't take long when I knew he was a Jehovah's Witness. So I asked him if he was, and he said, yes. I told him that I appreciated the witnesses because they were pretty close to the truth, but there were a few errors in their beliefs. And I would listen to him if afterwards he would listen to me. And he agreed. After he told me his beliefs, I asked him a few questions. I had just finished a study on the Holy Spirit in my seminary. I asked if he believed in the Holy Spirit. He said yes, but it was a power like electricity, not a person. So I showed him in his Bible, because theirs is different from the King James everyone else uses in the world. It was rewritten to fit their beliefs. You know that about the Jehovah's Witness in the Bible. It was rewritten to conform with their beliefs. In Ephesians 4.30, he read, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. And I asked, How does electricity grieve? And he didn't know how to answer. Or how about John 15.26? But when the Comforter comes, I will send him to you from the Father, and he shall testify of me. It says he shall testify of me. So now I had him thinking, so I went on. I asked, do you believe in Jesus? He said, yes. I asked, do you believe he is God? He said, no. I asked, who do you believe he is? And he said, the Archangel Michael. I asked him to read from his Bible. John 1 14 and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth so I asked him do you believe Jesus is the word made flesh he said yes I asked was Michael the only angel he said no I said but the scripture says only begotten of the father again he didn't know what to say I gave him one last scripture, John 1, verses 1 through 3. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Michael, I told him, is a created angel. Here it says the Word always was and created everything. Michael could have created himself. Then he concludes with these thoughts. What if I wouldn't have been prepared for that day? What if I wouldn't have studied about the Holy Spirit in seminary for, and for the previous weeks? God wanted someone to reach James. God knew I was prepared, and he brought James to my door that day. See, there's an importance of being prepared. There's, there, there's a reason why we're to study the Word of God, so that when any man asks, we can give an account for the hope that we have within us. If someone was to come up to you and say, why are you serving Jesus? What would you tell them? Are you prepared? Is this a piece of armor that you have truly put on? Are you prepared to share? See, we are not all preachers, teachers, or evangelists, but we all have gifts from the Holy Spirit that need to be that we need to recognize and use for the benefit and growth of the church. You need to discover your God-given talents and use it for His honor and glory. You need to put it on. But one thing, we may not be all teachers, preachers, evangelists, prophets, but we all can be a witness for Jesus Christ. We all can share the gospel. We all can share what Jesus has done for us. In fact, as I was doing with some of the youth leaders, I gave them uh, an application to fill out an honor and ask a question. Explain your testimony to me. Because, you know, sometimes, have you ever thought down, how can, when someone says, well, how did you meet Jesus? How would you explain it to them? How could you share with them how he's changed your heart and your life? And sometimes we try to do it so much on the fly. And, 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 and of course, us Pentecostals, I say, well, I'm just waiting for the Spirit to direct me. That's just being lazy. I mean, the Spirit will do that. The bottom line is, if you're caught off guard, He will come down and He'll move upon you and He will bring things you remember and you can speak it forth. But if we have a chance to be prepared and we're not prepared, don't expect Him to pull you out of the fire. 
He's given us a response, but this is one of those pieces of armor that we can prepare ourselves with the gospel of peace. We can get ready for it and know what we're talking about. Get ready to share it with people we come in contact with. You get ready to share this gospel. What is the gospel? It's the good news of the kingdom of heaven. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel of salvation. So I want you to hear something that Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, and verse 21 says this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And then in verse 21 He says, Then He began to speak to them, The Scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. And what he said there, you need to say, that is why the church is here. That's exactly why the church is here. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. To, to bring the good news to the poor. To proclaim to the captives that they will be released. That the blind will see that the oppressed will be set free. That the time of the Lord's favor has come. Because of Jesus Christ, this needs to be the message of the church. This needs to be the message of your proclamation. This needs to be the message that you're sharing with people. Because we are bringing hope. I'm going to ask our musicians to come. This is God's will and mission for our church. To preach reconciliation. Everybody knows what reconciliation is. Again, you know, a lot of times we use these words, people say, well, sometimes we read in the Bible, we think something different. What is reconciliation? Think about it. A man and a wife, they do what? They split up and possibly divorce. And what is reconciliation, John? They come back together. In other words, the separation, the brokenness that was there begins to be mended and brought back together. See, and that's literally what Jesus Christ did. Our relationship with God was literally broken like a marriage. We were divorced from Him because of our fornication, because of our adultery. We took on a different partner besides Him. How many of y'all know that in your marriage relationship you'd be upset if your husband or your wife went out and was sleeping with somebody else? You'd want to make him pull out a baseball bat and knock him upside the head. I didn't say kill him. You noticed that. I said knock him upside the head. Let the spirit of, as the spirit of, let the spirit of Jack slap come upon him and just work him over, right? But just imagine that in your mind for a minute. That's literally what Jesus Christ came to do. In that same sense as, as an unfaithful husband or wife did that and separates themselves in that marriage and causes that friction, it causes that to happen. Jesus Christ came down by giving His life on the cross to be able to take that and bring it back together. And to make it one again. To make it back in right standing and right relationship with each other. To where truly love can be there. See, God's love for us never changed. Our love for His changed. But when God pulls us back in, He begins to come in and move up our hearts and our lives. To where? We can have the love for Him that we should have and have the love for others that we should have seen. But this all comes through the gospel message. This comes through truly making ourselves prepared. Of going out, this is what we're to proclaim to the world. This is what God came to do. This is what the church is here for, to proclaim this, that Jesus came to reconcile us. Relationships that are broken, He came to put them back together again. This is the message of the church. This is the message we need to prepare ourselves to share. That's what these shoes are all about. See, and, and the enemy hates it because he wants to see destruction come. But we're talking about God can come in through Jesus Christ and bring, turn that destruction around and mend it back together and make it whole again. See, the unsaved are the ones we're commissioned, the ones we're called to share this with. I'm asking you to stand with me this morning. I'm actually going to read a resolution here this morning. And after I read it, I'm going to read it again. And if you say, Pastor, 
That's what I resolve to do. That's I'm going to put on these gospel shoes. I'm going to prepare myself to take out the gospel of peace. To proclaim it to the lost, the hurting, and the dying. I want to declare the favor of the Lord that it has come. That the captive will be set free. That the blind will be made to be seen. That can be physical, spiritual, or whatever. Statement one of this resolution is today we stand in the direct path of Satan. Now, you notice I started out with that. Because you need to understand something. When you stand on the direct path, look at him nose to nose, oh, you're telling him what? I mean business. I'm ready for a fight. You let those shoes dig in. He declared, I am going to stand in the direct path of Satan. I'm not, he's not coming by my road. He's not getting past me. I will defend the area that God has placed me in. And I'm able to defend it because I've taken on the armor that he has given me. Today, we plant our feet as a church in the ground, sinking our hobnails deep into the foundation of Christ. We need to understand, it's not us, but it's him. We can stand in his direct path because truly we know who we believe in. And we are persuaded. <laughs> he is able to keep that which we have committed unto him against that day. He is the faithful one. He is the one who has never lost a battle. Nor will he ever lose. That is who our faith. That is who our trust. That is who we're resting in, God. That is who we're digging our feet into. Is the foundation of Jesus Christ. And him crucified. And living again. Today, we stand firm on His Word and resist satanic attacks on our, upon our lives, our families, our church, and our country. See, if, so, if we don't take a stand, who will? If we don't stand strong, who will? And we declare today, this Scripture will be fulfilled in this church. And when I mean this church, I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about us as a group of believers, as followers of Jesus Christ. We will put on God's shoes on our feet. We will prepare to spread the good news of Jesus, the message of salvation to all. We will prepare to compel all who will to come and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That's what I'm asking you to do this morning. That's the resolution I'm asking you to stand and make today in this place. To put on this armor means there's a stand you're going to have to take. There's a walk you're going to have to go. There's a road you're going to have to dig these feet into. But all the while, understanding where you go, you're digging into the truth and the foundation of Jesus Christ. Him crucified and risen again. Because it's all about Him. And if you will resolve with me this morning, say, Pastor, I'm determined to do that. I'm asking you to slip out from where you're at and say, I, I take a hold of this resolution. I'm going to apply it today like never before. I'm going to stand upon it. I'm going to say, today we stand in the direct path of Satan. Today we plant our feet as the church in ground seeking our hobnails deep into the foundation of Christ. Today we stand firm on His Word and resist satanic attacks upon our lives, our families, our church. Our country today, this scripture will be fulfilled in this church. We will put on God's shoes on our feet. We will prepare to spread the gospel news of Jesus, the message of salvation to all. We will prepare to compel all who will to come and accept Jesus 
as their Lord and Savior. Just come and say, Lord, I'm determined that is my resolution today. That is my resolve. I give you my heart and my life. But right now, I put on those shoes because I'm going to take a stand for Jesus Christ and Him crucified, Him living again. As Christ Himself said, Lord, I'm going to declare the good news to the poor. Proclaim captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, that the time of the Lord's favor has come. 